All right, everyone, welcome back. And we are now at part four of the lecture, which is entitled Learning Rhythmic Patterns. Learning Rhythmic Patterns is divided into five different parts itself. One is attention to details. The second is understanding musical math, which we'll spend quite a time on. The third is imaging rhythms. The fourth is verbalizing the images. And the last is maintaining a steady pace. <clears throat> a few words of introduction. These are also fairly subjective statements, really. I think there are three levels that a person learns rhythmic patterns. And I don't consider any of the three levels to be wrong. I think they're probably progressive. Probably your insight as you mature as a musician uh, emphasizes how each of these build on the other. And they probably all take place at some point in performance. And at some point, even as a professional musician, you probably come back and use all three of these levels during your performance. The first I call the logical process of estimation. I think the logical process of estimation is the one that is built on sound association or imitation. And I think it's a wonderful way to learn rhythm. Those people that have the headphones on and are listening and are imitating sounds and are learning by sound and orienting themselves to the sound of music are just deepening the sounds of the rhythms much, much deeper inside them. And it's a wonderful way to start. Now, it doesn't make you a better reader, perhaps, ultimately, when it comes to looking at the noted music on the page in a practical sense mathematically. But it's certainly after you recognize what those symbols mean mathematically, and you've already internalized the sounds by listening to them, then you're just that much more solid when you've made that association. So I'm in total favor of that logical process of estimation or sound association imitation level of learning rhythms. The second level, of course, that we'll deal with now is the mathematical processes for understanding how rhythmic patterns work. Now, the mathematical process is wonderful because you notice it allowed us to be able to unify a rhythmic pattern and play it all together as a group. However, if a musician is a mathematically oriented performer, and there are many that could be considered so, you'll notice it in their performance because the performance will sound kind of stale and dry and emotionless. It won't seem to have that naturalness that, that it has to have if it's all caught up in the mathematical articulation of the exactness of the math of the music. So there has to be something else. Well, I call that the logical process of application. The logical process of application is based on the sounds that you're trying to produce, which is based on the experience that you have from the listening, which is based on the mathematical foundations that you've gleaned from doing the study of how music works together so that when you're doing a performance and we'll demonstrate it you're actually dealing with what rhythm and music and all of music actually is is the sound a natural freely displayed sound however it's embedded in imitation and math but it becomes free from that embeddedness into its natural performing sound which is the logical process of application now, we'll have to go back, though, to the mathematical level in order to be able to get up to that application level. Unfortunately, I think a lot of players skip from imitation to performance, and they leave out the mathematical level. And when they leave out the mathematical level, they don't have that grounding that's necessary to know what to draw back on when they get lost, when they can't just follow their ear, and they need the grounding of the math to be able to perform a more difficultly written rhythmic pattern. <clears throat> the first, then, is attention to details. It's B on your outline. It's a simple statement. It says, assume nothing when reading a page of rhythms. In fact, just consider that every note of every measure is wrong and prove it to be right. Don't assume when you're playing through a composition that you've played it right. Assume that you've played it wrong and go back and check every measure to make sure that it's right. How about example K over there under attention to details? Can somebody tell me, please, and this wasn't rehearsed, so I need to have you do it now. Uh, where is the mistake that occurs? Yes. 
Exactly. In measure eight of example K, we have a misnotated rhythmic pattern. Now, there perhaps could be more than one way to correct it, and you could do that by whatever notation you chose, but the fact is, you're really paying attention to details. Now, paying attention to details, of course, is just a, a, a way of, of living. It's a, a way of, of thinking. It occurs at all different kinds of levels, and it has something to do with your, your personality. It has something to do with the way you apply it. There, there was a uh, there was a book, a uh, famous book that was written by a, a famous author named Ernest Hemingway. Uh, I don't know if you remember the title of that book. Did, could, could you, can you announce the title of that book to the class? The Old Man in the Sea. Right. Uh, that he, did you hear? Could you hear what he said? I, I don't, could you hear it? To, the old man in the sea? Right. Now, you remember what I said about the application of playing rhythms properly, that you don't assume that something's right, even if you're in a, uh, a setup situation? Now, would you take that piece of paper and would you read those words one word at a time? The old man and, and the sea. Thank you. Point made. All right. <laughs> it would, there, there were some wonderful examples that that happened to at the, at, the, at the highest professional levels that I can't disclose here, but you would enjoy the results if you knew. <laughs> so anyway, it's a very common error. Um, all right. The next, understanding musical math. This this is uh, this is the basis for it. It was sort of like those three points that were made before about the pulse, the rhythmic pattern, and the unit count. Well, understanding the musical math is the unit count part. It's going to be that part which you count. The first is example L. This is based on my incredible quarter note, and it's just the start of it. This is the what I'll call later on when we're talking about a polyrhythm, we'll call it the numerical basis for it. The, qu the quarter note may be divided into two parts, which would be two eighth notes, or it may be divided into three notes in the time of two, which would be an eighth note triplet. So that's the numerical basis for it, okay? One, two, and, which might become one, two, and, one, d, and, uh, one, d, and, uh, and, and, uh, or it might be one, Two olet, one olet, and olet, one olet, and olet, and olet, one. It might become a division that goes into a subdivision based on that numerical basis. We'll get to that, but that's musical math. Now, this quarter note, as I just sort of demonstrated, can be divided and then subdivided into nine or more, but nine is certainly all we'll need to worry about parts. Look at example M in your chart. And you notice, especially if you'll look down the center of the chart, the quarter note is divided into two eighth notes. It is then divided into three eighth notes under a triplet sign. It is then subdivided into four sixteenth notes, and then you follow your chart on down through five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And that will show you the divisions and the subdivisions and the relationships, the mathematical relationships. Now, one important thing to remember is that when we develop a counting system for, say, the quarter note, we have developed the counting system for every single note that exists. It doesn't matter if it's a half note or an eighth note or a sixteenth note, and we're dividing and subdividing that note in up to nine parts. Once we've established the basic counting system, it's applicable to any kind of a division or a subdivision. That's why it's so imperative that you learn how to count your basic countings for your basic divisions and subdivisions, because it'll apply to all of your rhythmic patterns. So here are some very important rules for you to remember about counting, and then we'll make them applicable to these particular situations. All systems, all counting systems, whatever you might ultimately end up choosing, use to count rhythmic patterns, especially those that are used to count the smaller divisions of a pulse, contain inherent difficulties. There is no perfect counting system. All systems used to count rhythmic patterns need to be adjusted to fit the abilities of an individual performer. 
any rhythmic pattern may be counted from time to time using different parts of different counting systems if necessary. In any counting system, a point may be reached where the physical act of counting becomes more difficult than the performance of the rhythmic pattern itself. And when that occurs, you have to be able to make a subtle shift away from the math and more into that combination of the feel and the math. And the same or similar counting systems occur, as I said, in many different meter signatures. Look at example N and look in the center and you will see something listed as my preference JB. Now, this is an appropriate time to point out that all of the information that is occurring in this part of the lecture and throughout the lecture is paralleling the book and the course that was developed here at Georgia State entitled Developing Rhythmic Sensitivity. And even though I won't use the counting system at this moment, I will certainly honor the author for it, who was my co-author for this book, whose name was and is Howard Ryan Davis III, who I'm most privileged to introduce to you in the audience at this time who agreed to attend our presentation. And I would actually put a round of applause to Howard for, for being here. And that will clarify for you when you see my HRD preference when we were writing the book, because he had, of course, his own counting system at that time. All right, now, example in, under my preference, uh, being my lecture, <laughs> we move into the counting system of the quarter note being divided into two eighth notes onto an eighth note triplet, four sixteenths, five, six, seven, eight, and nine divisions and sub divisions and it'll sound like this and I'll give a little explanation afterwards and it's very important because I'm going to ask you to try and emulate this try and do the same sound that I make in a moment at the moment I'm going to leave off the positions meaning that the place that it would fall in a 9-4 measure, so I'm not going to count to 9. I'm just going to do the duration, so I'm going to do the count being 1 each time. It would be 1, 1 and, 1 o oh, let, 1 d and, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1 o oh, let and, o oh, let, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1 d and, uh, and d and, uh, 1 o oh, let and, o oh, let and, o oh, let 1. Now, here's the logic behind that. If I take 1 and I divide it into two eighth notes, I have 1, one and one and. Now you hear where the one and the and fall. All right, I want to go to the 16th notes. I want to use a plosive consonant sound, which is a D, not an E or an uh, because it's going to give a more pointed articulation. So I'm going to keep the and count the same, and I'm going to use a D and a duh, keep the and count the same, and it'll become one D and duh, one D and duh, one and. Same thing on the and, one D and duh, one D and duh. Now I want a counting system for the 32nd notes. I'll keep the one and the and the same, I'll keep the D and the duh the same, but I'll add one D and the and the and the one D and the and the and the one D and the and the and the. Now I have a counting system for my 32nd notes. So my counting system becomes for that progression of the numerical origin one, one and, one D and the, one D and the and the and the one, one and. 1D and a, 1D and a, and the and a. Now it doesn't matter that I'm playing quarters, two eighths, four sixteenths, and eight thirty seconds, because I could have started with an eighth note, and then I would have been dividing, subdividing on down into smaller vowels. Could have started with a half note, then I'd been dividing and subdividing down into smaller vowels. It's those divided, subdivided relationships that matter. Count that out loud with me. Try this tongue twister. This is for you to practice while you're driving, in the shower, when you're walking to class. You know, you practice these tongue twisting one d and a and d and a kind of sounds. A little trumpet background would help too, you know, to get your taka uh, taka All right, so I'll say it and I'll keep saying it and you try to join me. Ready? Go. One. One and. One d and a. One d and a and d and a. One. One and. One d and a. One d and a and d and a. One. One more time. One and. One d and a. One d and a and d and a. One. Now, if I go to the triplet, I have one. One o let. One o let and o let. One o let and o let and o let one. 
one, <coughs> one OLED, one OLED, and OLED, one OLED, and OLED, and OLED, one. Now what I've done is gone from one to three to six to nine. Okay? So it's a quarter note, eighth note triplets, a sextuplet, and a group of nine thirty second notes. That'll take care of about every counting problem you would encounter. Try to say that with me. First, just try to say this. One OLED, and OLED, and OLED, one. Go. One OLED, and OLED, and OLED, one. Again. One OLED, and OLED, and OLED, one. Now the six is one OLED, and OLED. Ready? Go. One OLED, and OLED. Ready? Go. One OLED, and OLED. Okay. Now it's going to sound like this. I'll do it, and then you join me the second time. One. One OLED, one OLED, and OLED, one OLED, and OLED, and OLED, one. Go. One OLED, one OLED, and OLED, one OLED, and OLED, and OLED, one. Again. One OLED, one OLED, and OLED, one OLED, and OLED, and OLED, one. Now, you have these odd groupings of five or seven. I found nothing ever better than to count to five. One, two, three, four, five, one. Individualize every note. Don't put any pulse groupings in whatsoever. Go from one to one. One, two, three, four, five, one. So you're connecting. And on seven, use S, V, N. So you make the seven, which is two syllables, into one syllable. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. So it's one, two, three, four, five, one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. One, two, three, four, five, one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Go. One, two, three, four, five, one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. One, two, three, four, five, one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. All right, now we'll put those together with the ones, and it'll sound like this. One, two, I'm oh, sorry. One, one, and one, oh, let, one, D, and a, one, two, three, four, five, one, no, let, and no, let, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, D, and a, and D, and a, one, no, let, and no, let, and no, let, one. That gives you your counting system through nine. Come on. Ready, go. One, one, and one, oh, let, one, D, and a, one, two, three, four, five, one, no, let, and no, let, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, D, and a, and D, and a, one, no, let, and no, let, and no, let, one, again, one. One and one OLED, one D and a one, two, three, four, five, one OLED and OLED, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one D and a and D and a one OLED and OLED and OLED one. All right. Good. Now, that's going to be very important as you'll see in a few minutes. Now, let's take an example of how you could practice this. Let's take the phone book, for instance. It's got a, quite a few numbers in it. And let's assign in the phone book the numbers 0, you see it coming, 0 through 9, all right? And you will make 0 the quarter rest and 1 the quarter note and so on up through the 930 seconds. Now there's your example, example O. Now look over at example P. And under example P, I've made a phone number. The phone number is 7321546. So that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 2, OLED 3 and 4, 5, 2, 3, 4, 5, 60, and a 7 OLED and OLED. Right? You see? Because the first count would be 7 sixteenths, the second count would be an eighth note triplet, the third would be the two eighth notes, the fourth count would be the quarter, and so on. So you've assigned a mathematical value. So now, you see, when you answer the phone, you can not say, hello, you've, you've reached Howard Davis at. You can simply say, hello, you've reached 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 2, OLED, 3, and 4, 5, 2, 3, 4, 5, 60, and uh, 7, OLED, and OLED. Please leave a message at the tone. <laughs> You could also take playing cards. You could assign those playing cards in any manner that you want and practice. One D and a and D and a two and three, two, three, four, five, four, let and a let and a let, five D and a six, O oh, let. Okay? And just randomly change those around. Of course, you've got the entire phone book to pick. You could take individual notes that you would write out, like eighth notes or sixteenth notes and randomly set those up on a music stand and then practice assigning a system of counting to those or any infinite other number of ways. Let me give you a preparatory way that is listed specifically in my book that I hope would be valuable, which is example Q. Look at example Q on your outline. Now this should make some sense. It doesn't matter what the denominator of this meter signature is. It can't be too many things, by the way. It could be a whole note, a half 
note, a quarter note, an eighth note, a sixteenth, a thirty-second, or a sixty-fourth. That's about it. We don't see too many hundred and twenty-eighth notes, but once in a while they'll show up. So we don't have too many values on the bottom. The values on the top represent the number of pulses occurring in one measure of time. So what really happens in example Q is this. One, one and one and one, 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 two, three, four, five, one, oh, let one, one, oh, let and oh, let one, oh, let one, one, D and oh, one, two, three, four, five, one. Are you following me, I hope? All right, count it with me. Let's take the last line, in case you learned the first line already. The last line, ready, go. One no let and no let. One two three four five six seven. One two three four five. One d and a and d and a. One d and a. One let and a let and a let. One d and a and d and a. One two three four five. One two three four five six seven. One no let and no let. Let and no let. One d and a and d and a. One two three four five. One let and a let and a let. One d and a and d and a. One no let and no let. One two three four five six seven. One d and a and d and a. One no let and no let. One no let and no let and a let. One d and a and d and a. One two three four five six seven. One two three four five six seven. Now, when you become tired, tongue dried, worn out, when you're sweating, then you are practicing. That is really practicing. When you lose your voice working on these, then you're practicing. That's the way you'll become good at rhythm. And you'll see that as you start to practice these exercises in Dr. Gerber's class. All right. Now, that was example P and Q. So my, my reminder to you is to course Mind your P's and Q's. <laughs> now, <clears throat> we move on to the next one, which is note value relationships. I simply pose this as a question, and during the forthcoming pizza party, anyone that would like to bring this answer to me back, I will be happy to respond as to whether you determined uh, the proper solution to it. If, in note value relationships, a dotted quarter note is equal to a metronome marking of 80, what would the value of the quarter note be? If a dotted quarter note equals a metronome marking of 80, what would the value of the quarter note be? And the second question, if a quarter note is equal to a metronome marking of 96, what would the value of a dotted quarter note be? Now you can do a whole series of those musical math relationships to get your mind thinking more about rhythm. We're on example R. This is an essence out of the book, Developing Rhythmic Sensitivity. This is the way the book and rhythm should be approached. This is the way I believe you will become very good at rhythm if you will practice rhythmic exercises this way. The first way is for the metronome to be running, for you to count out loud and clap the rhythmic pattern with the metronome running using an acceptable counting pattern. The second way is for you to conduct the meter signature of the rhythm exercise while you tap the rhythm and the metronome is running. And the third way is for you to conduct the meter signature and then you verbalize the rhythm pattern using any kind of an articulate sound like a ta or a da or a ka. So we're going to do some of that on these following exercises. And the way the exercises are divided are the way rhythm is divided. No division of the pulse, the division of the pulse into two equal durations, the division of the pulse into three equal durations, and the division of the pulse into four equal durations, and then the division in the pulse up to nine equal durations. And that'll take care of what actually occurs in the book. Look at example R. Let's say that the metronome is running this fast. Tick, 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 tick. It's one, two, three, four. What I'd like you to do simply is to count out loud and clap the rhythm that you see, please, in example R. Chant-like style. Find that energy that's probably dwaning here, but find that energy recoup it, count with intensity, clap hard, and keep the rhythm going solid in example R as you count and clap, uh, count out loud and clap. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, thank you. Now, conduct. 
One, two, three, four. One, two. Conduct with your right hand if you're right-handed, and I'll let you go with your left if that's all foreign to you, but primarily with your right hand. Now, count out loud. The metronome would be going. We just couldn't coordinate it, I don't think, with the group and that much sound at the moment. Now, we're going to count out loud, so it'll be like this. One, two, three, four, and then on a surface like your leg, solid, solid tap the noted rhythmic pattern, but while you're conducting, don't lose that conducting pattern as you tap these rhythms against the conducting pattern. Here we go. One, two, three, go. One, two, three, four. 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 All right. Then you want to ta it, or ta ba, or ka. You want to make the sound of the noted rhythmic pattern while you're conducting and the metronome is going. So the metronome's going tick, 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 and you're going one, two, three, and you go ta, 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 ta. Here we go. Two, conduct. One, two, ready, go. Ta, 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 three, four, ta, 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 thank you. Now, that establishes the principle. Now we have to establish the challenge, which is to move from no division of the pulse to two equal durations, three equal durations, four equal durations, and up to nine equal durations. And I think you'll see the inherent difficulties that start to happen as we move forward. All right, we take example uh, S, which is the division of the pulse into two equal durations. So uh, you know the three methods now, so I'll just pick one at random and ask you to join me. We're going to have the metronome going which would be one, two, three, four. We're going to conduct, count out loud, and then you're going to tap the noted rhythmic pattern in example S. If you get a note that's long, like a quarter note that's tied in measure three to measure four, hold your hand down against the surface as though you were sustaining the sound, and then release it at the point that it would rearticulate, just as you will when you're tying it, okay? <clears throat> so try your best. Example S, here we go. Two counts, and then we're conducting the downbeat of the first measure of example S. Ready? Three, four. One and two and three and four. And one and two and three and four. One and two and three and four. One and two and three, four. One, two, three and four. And one and two and three and four and... Try it again. Try it again. <laughs> uh, you're laughing. That means something must be going wrong out there. I don't know. Uh, well, we get, get close-ups. Yeah, good. We get close-ups. All right. Yeah, very good. All right. Now, here we go. Two counts. Don't get the faces, though. Okay. <laughs> Three, four, one and two and three and four, and one and two and three and four, one and two and three and four, one and two and three, four, one, two, three and four, and one and two and three and four, and all right. Now it might be one, two, three, four. You might also articulate it then conducting and doing the tie kind of sound. All right, number eight under our learning uh, the mathematical parts of rhythm. There are eight sounds or variations that are possible in each quarter note value using from zero to three eighth notes, and I have those listed for you. This is extremely important because, example U, there are 16 sounds that are available using from zero to four sixteenth notes, but it does show you the division and A method for notating and A kind of notation for dividing or subdividing a quarter note into other up to eight parts or in up to 16 parts. Well, why is that important? I don't know what the percentage is, but I do know that if you take these 24 note combinations that there have been determined by one of my good former percussion majors named J Jason Mraz, who was also a mathematics major, uh, on 216 of 2000, he determined for me that there were at least 55 billion possibilities for two measures of time uh, in 4-4 time that used uh, these uh, 24 
combinations of sound. So if you think about those 55 possible billion combinations, you know why most of your music is going to exist as divisions and subdivisions of the quarter note or some similar note being divided or subdivided into eight or 16 parts. What you might not also think about too is that all your jazz is basically built from these eight sounds and all your rock and roll is built from these other 16 sounds. And I'd like to go into a more detailed explanation of that, but it really is true if you look back and see that. So those are your sounds. They would sound like this. One olet, 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 one olet. And like this. One D and a 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 and a one D 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 and a right now example V the division of the pulse into three equal durations let's see. Let's try counting out loud. The metronome's going and we'll clap. Now, I better do a demonstration first here to make sure you're with me. The metronome's going. I wish we could coordinate it, but we'd have to have a very loud metronome. So it'd be one olet, two olet. Watch and listen. One olet, two olet, three olet, four olet, one olet, two olet, three, and four olet, one olet, two olet, three olet, four olet, one olet, two olet. Let four O let one and two and three O let four O let one O let two and three O let four and here we go. This is the counting out loud and clapping. Two, three, go. One O let two O let three O let count out loud. One O let two O let three and four O let one O let two O let three O let four O let one O let two O let three O let four O let and two and three O oh, let four O oh, let one O oh, let two and three O oh, let four and thank you. I'm losing your voices. You're wearing out, but we're almost there. Hang on. All right, number eleven. The division of the pulse into four equal durations. Well, let's just say that we had clapped it, we had conducted it, and one and a two D and a one and two D and a one D and a two D and a one D and a the two and one D and the two and the one D and two D and one D and the two D and one D and the two D and the one D and two D and done all those kind of exercises. Now we're going to go to the next step, which would be the tying sound, and we want to really pick the tempo up and get the sound of that. See so something like one two one two da 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 you add pace to it. You add pace to the sound and articulate. Look at number 12. After you've understood how rhythms work in general, there's a common mistake that's often made, and I'm going to play the mistake and almost dare you to hear it, and you tell me if you do. Here's the mistake of example X. One, two, three, four. One and two and three and four and one O oh, lit two O oh, lit three O oh, lit four O oh, lit one D and a two D and a three D and a four D and a. Would somebody be brave enough, perhaps, to point out what they thought the radical mistake was of that performance? Kind of pause before you. Right, exactly. I paused before I moved from one measure to the other, and the reason was that the artificial space I created was caused by the notorious bar line, which often causes students to get that blockage in there. Well, the point is that the quarter note, which is the fourth count of the first measure, has exactly the same spacing to the first eighth note of the second measure. So you really need to think of the fourth quarter note of the first measure being the same spacing to the first eighth note of the next measure. That's one of the reasons that percussionists get behind, by the way, because they tend to think of that bar line or they tend to think of that measure per measure rather than the phrasing that a flute player or someone might think of where they keep moving ahead a little bit more. So it's not really one one, two, three, four, one, and two. it's really one, two, 
three, four, one, and two, and three, and four, and one. O lit, two, O lit, three, O lit, four, O lit, one. D and de, two, D. It's always moving from the bar into the next bar that keeps the music and the phrase moving forward. Okay? Important little point. The last division of all the pulses is to divide the pulse all the way up through nine counts. And I know you have the principle, now it's just the application of the principle at its most difficult level, which is absolutely necessary. You should be able to divide and subdivide a rhythmic pattern up to nine divisions and subdivisions. We did it back on our exercises. Here it is in a demonstration of application. It would be one, Two, two, three, four, five, three, and four D and five O lit one O lit two D and a and D and a three O lit four and a five and one O lit and O lit two and three O lit four and five D and one O lit two D and a and D and a three O lit four D and five D and or if I wanted to take that and make it much more natural as I talked about Tom. I get rid of all the math that's in there. The math actually is going. When I go, what I hear is sort of one no let and no let two and. I can't get rid of that sound. It's, it's going through my mind. One no let and no let two and. But that would come out. What I want is. I want it to be a phrase. I want it to be something natural. So I'm listening to the embedded math, but I'm playing the sound that might be necessary according to the style and the articulation of the music. It has to be embedded in the math. I'm not guessing at it. I'm not associating it with something I've heard that might be an estimate. I'm embedding it in the math so that that's there solid, but then I'm making a practical application at the higher level. Example Z, when you go to eighth note pulses, all you're doing is changing the meter signature. We've done it all now, folks. You can't change the count value. This is simply 1D and a 2D and a 1D and a 2D and a 1O lit 2D and a 1D and a 2D and. It's just a matter of what count value you assign according to the meter signature. We go to a 216 meter signature in example AA. 1D and and a 2D and a 1D and a 2D and a 1D and a 2O lit 1. I cannot change the values. You see, that's why you have to learn those value mathematical relationships. Then it'll be applicable to any meter signature. But if you don't learn the math, then you won't know how to apply it to the basic meter signatures, much less the, quote, more intricate meter signatures. All right, now we have about a three-minute introduction to jazz for those of you that may not have been able to play jazz. I humbly apologize to our jazz master here by reducing all of jazz to four short rules. However, I elevate those of you that might never have had any jazz, and we will give you your first and only jazz lesson at the moment that will allow you to play this next page of exercise. Uh, the next example, example BB, in a jazz style. This doesn't have to do with style or duration or a particular kind of articulation, but it does have a little bit to do with the point of articulation of the specific rhythm. So, if we have a jazz rhythm, we're going to follow these rules for this moment only, for this class. We're going to keep it closed up in this room uh, so Dr. Gibson doesn't, doesn't get offended on the street here by this. All right. Now, first, a quarter note is going to be equal to a quarter note. We're just going to play the quarter notes as we normally would when we see the exercises here in example BB. The eighth note triplets, we're going to play them just as written. However, if we see two eighth notes in a row, we're going to play the second eighth note as the third note of an eighth note triplet. That is, we're going to play the eighth note upbeat, the and, as the third note of an eighth note triplet. So one and two becomes one o lit two. 
All right, so the eighth note upbeat is the third note of a triplet. And now to stretch the rule a little bit, any eighth note upbeat occurring on any count, and this is the part that a non-jazz person might really have to uh, find valuable to be able to even uh, feel your way into your first experience, any note that occurs on an eighth note upbeat, like a note that occurs on the and of two, well just think of that note as occurring on the third part of the second count's triplet. And that'll get you in the ballpark for that articulation. So in the second measure where you see written, one and two and three and four and, what you're really going to do instead of playing it on the and of two is you're going to play it on the third part of the second count's triplet. One O oh, let, two O oh, let, three, and then that next dotted quarter note, it's really on the and of three, so you're not going to play it on the and of three, you're going to play it on the third part of the third count's triplet. So it comes out like this. One O oh, let, two O oh, let, three O oh, let, four O oh, let, do, two, ba, do, ba. Now, three rules, and then you've got to try and apply them by imitation, probably, if you don't know how to do this. Otherwise, you'll be able to read the rhythms naturally. Quarter notes are played as written. Eighth note triplets are played as written. Eighth note afterbeats are played as the third note of a triplet on that count. And any and count, whatever count it's on as an and count, you play it as a third part of a triplet on that and count. That won't get you the duration, but it'll get you the point of articulation. All right, do your best, stay with me, play along on example BB in jazz style. We're only uh, a couple of examples from the end of the whole lecture, so stay very alert here. One. Two O lit, three O lit, four O lit, one O lit, two O lit, three O lit, four O lit, one O lit, two O lit, three O lit, four O lit, let two O lit, three O lit, four O lit, one O lit, two O lit, three O lit, four O lit, one O lit, two O lit, three O lit, four O lit, one O lit, two O lit, three O lit, four O, one O lit. Put that into the jazz flavor sound. It comes out like this. Do ba da. Da bu da da ba do pa do ba do pa 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 bu da do ba do pa do ba da ga do pa da, which is really, as far as our math is concerned, underneath one o lit two o lit three o lit four o lit one o lit two o lit, and we're just placing it in right on top of the triplet. That's why back here I said in example eight that one o lit two o lit three o lit or one two three one two three those eighth notes are the basis for that jazz sound. All right, number 17, counter rhythms. You have it written as a definition on your paper. First of all, they occur within the same time period. Two different rhythmic patterns having the same character, having the following characteristics. They occur within the same time period, the same amount of time, the same distance of time. Second, they're not equally divisible into each other. Third, they have num different numerical origins, and I've talked about those numerical origins, quarter to two-eighths to four-sixteenths, quarter to triplets to sixths, and at least one of the rhythms has to be superimposed or not a natural subdivision or a division of the denominator of the meter signature. Now, think about this, and we'll come back to our most impossible rhythm here the one that seemed to defy all of our rules but really doesn't. If I take this distance, it represents two different rhythms occurring in the same amount of time, two different rhythmic patterns. One of the rhythmic patterns would be a quarter note and the other quarter note of the measure. The first rhythmic pattern that you see noted on the board would be the five eighth notes that occur over these two quarter note counts. So we have two different rhythmic patterns occurring in the same amount of time. They are not equally divisible into each other, and one of them is not a natural occurring division of subdivision of the denominator of the meter signature. Now what do we have to do? We have to find the lowest common multiple, the LCM, between those two rhythms. What is the lowest common and multiple between these two rhythms. What number? 10. All right. There's only one value of 10 notes that go back to our standard notation that can occur on these two counts of the measure that our standard notation 
that will allow us to have a unit count, the smallest practical division or subdivision of our noted rhythmic pattern. Do you remember? We had five sixteenth notes occurring under a five sign. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So it was two, two, three, four, five, three, two, three, four, five. That would be the unit count for the second and third counts of this measure. This measure is really one D and uh, two, two, three, four, five, three, two, three, four, five, four, and two, two, three, four, five, three, two, three, four, five. What is that? That's two groups of five. But if I'm going to play this rhythm, I'm not going to play two groups of five. I'm going to play five groups of two. Therefore, I'm going to play on one, three, five, two, and four. So it comes out like this. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. All I'm doing again is taking that natural division and subdivision of the five, that very five that I gave you in that example that was the basic pattern for all of rhythm, and shifting the accent. See, it doesn't matter how hard it looks on the page. You can't change these intrinsic values of rhythm. You can just change the way they look and how they're counted. You can't change their values. So once you understand the math, then we can go one, two, Three, four, one D and uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, four, and which is really one D and uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, four, and one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, four, and I can't make it easy to do, but I can certainly make it possible to do because you have to practice it, you have to get good at it. So count with me because we're going to, before we unbar these doors, we're going to nail the hardest rhythm that most musicians would falter on their entire life. But first, count the unit count. Count one D and uh, two, two, three, four, five, three, two. And let, let's make it more practical. Let's not worry about position at the moment. Let's just, or do, let's not worry about position. Let's just concentrate on duration. Let's make it one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Because that'll still work where you can go one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five when you hit it here. And then you could add uh, two, two, three, four, five, three, two, three, four, five at a later period on your own practice. So this will be one D and uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, four, and. I think you can articulate that a little easier, okay? Ready? Count. One D and uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, four, and. Now let's get a little bit more of the uh, outside um, <clears throat> ape type uh, chant style of voice, articulate, uh, individualized, monotone, energy chant. I only have a few minutes to go here to put out the energy. Ready? And go now. One D and uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, four, and. Now emphasize one, three, five, Five, two, and four. So it's going to be one D and uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, four, and. Ready? Go. One D and uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, four, and. Now clap. Ready? Go. And one D and uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, four, and. Ready? Go. And one D and uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, four, and ready, go. One D and uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, four, and. Now, what you need to do is set up your fives over here a little bit. You'll have to leave them for a second here, then you'll have them in your mind when you come back to them. So you can go like one, two, Three two three four five four two three four five one D and uh, one two three four five one two three four five four and one two three two three four five four two three four five one D and uh, one two three four five one two three four five four and one and you really will be playing that rhythm. You ready? Count, clap, chant, unify, listen to each other. Do it solid. There always has to be an aggressive leader on that, and everybody will, you know, rally around it. Three and four. Go. One, two, three, two, three, four, five, four, two, three, four, five, one D and uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, four, and one, two, three, 
four. I won't press my luck on that. I congratulate you. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, and you, you notice the remarkable difference between that and the first performance. So we have progressed. We can unbolt the doors. We're almost ready to go out them. D, imaging rhythms. Imaging rhythms is a fancy term, which in essence means the ability to conceive of, which is think of, or perceive, which is to take dictation of rhythmic patterns. Now, once you've been able to take dictation of a rhythmic pattern, you're really being able to internalize it. If you want to get better at rhythmic patterns, get together with a partner and play rhythmic patterns for each other and one person write down the patterns that the other is playing. If you're having trouble with rhythms, start with the simple patterns and work your way up to the more difficult ones. But you can't take dictation and you can't understand and listen or image rhythms unless you try to do it. It isn't something that will just happen. You, it's a process. It's, an, it's, it's the learning process. You remember the preparation and if you don't practice, you're not preparing and then the incubation period has to take place. That moment of illumination, the aha moment, I understand, and then the verification takes place where you check it with your partner and you see if you really did practice it right. But you've got to go through the learning process, and as you do, it'll become easier. Well, here are a few hints that'll help with that. Knowing the meter signature, certainly. Knowing the number of measures, whether there is the existence of pickup notes or not. You could just write note head slashes down and then go back and try to fill them in, sort of like ametric notation. You could have count marks or slashes above the measure notating out the number of counts and you're trying to line that up, you could try conducting as the, note, as the dictation is given and see if you can fill in against the conducting pattern. You could try centering on specific parts of the notation. For instance, if it's two measures long, just concentrate on the first measure and then keep saying it to yourself and block out the second measure, well, get them out of there, out of your mind, and then write that first measure down. Then the second time that it's played, get that second measure back. Or you can practice the, uh, the dictation with all different kinds of notes, practice saying it with ta, but you have to practice, you have to think, you have to play it with high energy, you have to try it hard, and you have to have a lot of confidence when you're taking dictation, but you mostly just have to try it and work on it. When you hear a piece of music on the radio, repeat the rhythmic sound of the melody that you've heard and try to visualize in your mind what that rhythm would look like. And little by little by little, dum dum da da dum dum Da, 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 becomes a noted rhythm for you of some sort. You start to see the sound of the rhythm. E, verbalizing the images is basically what this entire lecture has been about. It is trying to put into words what a study is about. It's trying to either paint a mental picture for you of how all this works, because you remember this course for me and for you in any endeavor started with a blank sheet of paper, nothing, and then it evolved into this lecture in this moment. So it was an evolving process of trying to paint a picture into your mind and my mind as to how rhythm works, to piece it all together, to be sure. It's sort of like a philosophy that becomes a, a, a fact and then becomes a law because people accept it and find it to be true and workable. And maybe that's what's happening if you'll accept these rules as being fact or you'll amplify or, or uh, improve on them. So you try to verbalize these images. You try to put all of this into words, describe it to people, teach it so it can be retaught because this is an art form. I'm handing down an art form to you just as though I were handing down a tribal song to you so that you can reteach it. Now, this can be done through precise mathematical explanation, and that's partially what I've tried to give you. It can also be done through analogies. For instance, an, an idea of an analogy in music is that we could take a sound like the sound of a taquita. Well, if I say, this music is supposed to sound like taquita, well, how would you write the sound of music that sounds like a taquita? It might come out, dum, ta 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 ti ta 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 And I'd say, no, I think I want it to sound more like a maluma. And you'd say, all right, dum, bum, pi ta 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 Bom, bom. So now you've created a sound in music that's an analogy. It's more like a maluma. So you need to be able to verbalize an image. You need to be able to picture an image. You need to be able to, to describe and recreate it so that it maintains its heritage. That's what we're doing as we preserve this lecture and this part of rhythmical uh, information on history. 
the last rule and the last law is the maintaining of a steady pace, the last demonstration. So here is your final law of the day, the law of steady pace. The ability to maintain steady pace is absolutely necessary in order to perform all rhythmic patterns successfully. Pace, which is the speed at which the pulses of a measure of time occur, first, as we've learned, is an objective, unchanging, and evenly divided measurement of time. So internalizing and consciously maintaining a steady pace when you're performing is the basis of all of your musical phrases. But second, as you've now learned, pace is a very subjective process. And it's a subjective process that allows the music to flow freely. You remember the example that the music flows naturally so that it's not so mathematically calculated and that it gives and it takes. Now, the ability, though, to maintain a steady pace is an absolute, absolute necessity to be a good musician. And the way that you develop that steady pace is to use a metronome. A metronome is relentlessly steady. It's totally non-emotional. It doesn't care anything about you. And it will not give in if you are not steady. There are a few things to remember, finally, about using a metronome. Contrary to widespread belief, the use of a metronome cannot, I believe, give you an accurate sense of time. The use of a metronome can verify that you do not have an accurate sense of time. You have to give yourself an accurate sense of time by using a metronome. Second, the ability to play accurately with a metronome is one of the most basic steps of the many steps in rhythmic development. So I can't de-emphasize that at this late point in this long lecture. It is very, very important. And no musician, finally, possesses such a sense of time that is so perfect that it can't be improved by practicing with a metronome. Listen to the metronome and look at example CC. Now, if the metronome were clicking on its common position, it would be a quarter note. So it would go like this. One, two, three, four. And one, and two, and three, and four. And one, and two, and three, and four. However, I could displace that to make myself more aware of the metronome and make myself more accurate and shift it to the eighth note after beat. And one, and two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and. Then if I come over to exercise DD, the metronome could be the downbeat, and I'm thinking triplets. Two O oh, lit, three O oh, lit, four O oh, lit, one O oh, lit, two O oh, lit, three O oh, lit, four O oh, lit, one O oh, lit, two O oh, lit, three and four O oh, lit, O oh, lit, two O oh, lit, three O oh, lit, four O oh, lit. However, I could take this metronome and I could move it over an eighth note of the eighth note triplet, and I'm going to say this is now the second note of the eighth note triplet, not the first note. So it becomes O oh, lit, two O oh, lit, three O oh, lit, O oh, lit, one O oh, lit, two O oh, lit, three O oh, lit, four O oh, lit, one O oh, lit, two O oh, lit, three, four O oh, lit, one O oh, lit, two O oh, lit, three O oh, lit, four O oh, lit. Or I could shift it over to become the third note of the eighth note triplet, so it becomes let one o oh, let two o oh, let three o oh, let four o oh, let one o oh, let two o oh, let three o oh, let four o oh, let one o oh, let two o oh, three uh, four o oh, let one o oh, let two o oh, let three o oh, let four o oh, let and that makes it a little more challenging but it also holds you in time that much tighter now i go down to example e and you hear it coming right it could be the first note of the 4 sixteenths. 1D and a 2D and a 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 1D and a 2D and a. Or I could make it the second of the two sixteenths. D and a 1D and a 2D and a and a 2D and a 1D 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 and a 2D and a. See that I started to rush a little bit and it held me right back because if it's on that second sixteenth. You can't rush. Could be on the and count. 
and two, and one D, and a two D, and a one, and two D, and a one, and a two D, and a one D, and a two D, and a one D, and a two, and. Or if you really want to torture yourself, you can put it on the last sixteenth of each group of four. Da one D and da two D and 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 da. And that tightens your rhythm down to the absolute tightest degree by displacing the point of articulation of the metronome. Finally, as I said in part five, related concepts of energy, concentration, confidence, coordination, and creativity, which you can read about, are important related concepts that I used to have people write papers about in the class, and they found it to be self-revealing, a self-catharsis sometimes, uh, because it made them think about the related concepts to just purely the ability to be able to perform rhythms, and that's why these particular words were chosen. And then finally, the grand finale, we're going to take all the aspects of rhythm, combine it with metric modulation, and I'll give you a little example of that very last example that you have, which would be um, example F uh, in, uh, in total. That is example F on your outline, isn't it? I think so, I don't have it listed that way here, but it's my grand finale quote. Now, I'll, I'll grunt and groan some in this, and I have to apologize for that, because I have to apply certain counting principles of all three levels, meaning logical process of the estimation, of application, the mathematical level, and uh, I won't guarantee that this is the most perfect performance. It's uh, worthy of continuous practice, but this will be a good example of how all these factors are at work. Now, if it doesn't sound or look right to you, it might be true that it isn't, but more likely it's true that you would expect it to follow a standard notation sound. But remember, I'm applying the concepts of metric, uh, of, uh, the, uh, uh, metric modulation to it, so that's going to really change radically the way that it's articulated. One olet, two olet, three olet. One olet, two olet, three olet. One and two d and one and two two three four five one two three four five. Four. One two three four five six one and two and three, four and one and two and three d and four olet. Two olet, three olet. One two three d and one d and two. Three, four, one, two, and three D and a four and one two three four five one two three four five four and one and two and three and four and five and six brings me back to OLED two OLED three where I started. There are three comments that occur on my career sheet for you, and I think those are appropriate to say here. They're very minor one-sentence comments uh, in length, but very substantial perhaps in purpose. <coughs> for whatever your endeavors would be, I wish for you that when you attempt to do something, you do it a little better than anyone else around you, and I sincerely believe that if you do that, you will succeed, you will be a success. The second is the use of your time. As we've talked about so much, your time is divided. And if you will use wisely every second of every minute of every hour, and you look back someday, if it isn't actually twice as long, I think you'll find that your life at least has seemed twice as long. And the third, and I find it to be most true in the aging process, and for those of you that it is a concern for, if you find, discover, and nurture the source of your being, and you perhaps as a result will also discover what lies for yourself beyond this life. 
And I thank all of you for being such a wonderful audience today and a good class and enduring this long lecture and this presentation for me to be able to preserve a course and what I hope would be a part of history and a 15 year endeavor for writing the book and uh, preserving the class as it existed here at Georgia State. And I also thank deeply Georgia State University, Dr. Stuart Gerber and the members of the video crew and the ones that will be cutting this into a DVD for permanent pres uh, preservation uh, for the future. Thank you very much.